Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure to be here today presenting our webinar entitled A Guide to Mapping the Complexity of the Tumor Microenvironment. Please allow a few seconds to show you our disclaimer. Feel free to take a screenshot if you would like to read it through. This is the agenda for today's talk. First of all, I will introduce the concepts of intra and intertumor heterogeneity which are very much related with the existence of the tumor microenvironment. I will then show you the different ways to analyze the tumor microenvironment, and these have been classified based on their dimensionality. And we will focus on single cell methods, and in particular, on the sample preparation which is required to obtain high quality samples that will give us reliable single cell data. I will then pass the mic to my colleague, Dr. Jablowski, who will introduce us to spatial biology. She will also show us the workflow for doing spatial analysis, and she will um, show some very interesting recent immuno-oncology applications. And finally, she will give us the concluding remarks for today's talk. So let's go ahead and get started. What we mean for tumor heterogeneity is really variability between the tumor site. And this variability can be related to different uh, quantities. So first of all, we will have molecular variability, meaning that we have a certain genomic instability in the tumor, but also epigenetic variations. And then different substances will be present in different areas of the um, tumor site, even outside of the cells, but in the extracellular matrix. Obviously, we have a lot of cellular variability, meaning that we not only have different cancer cells, but we also have many different phenotypes that populate the tumor microenvironment. And if we combine uh, these two concepts of molecular and cellular variability and see how they are arranged in space, then we can conclude that we will also have uh, architectural variability in our tumor. It's very important to note that this uh, heterogeneity happens at the intertumor level, meaning that different patients with the same diagnosis can have very different looking diseases. But this also happens at the intratumor level, and this really creates the complexity of the tumor microenvironment. In fact, this um, heterogeneity is real at the genetic and non-genetic level as well, even within the same primary tumor site. So let's start to review more in detail the different aspects of tumor heterogeneity. Here we can start with architectural heterogeneity, which is really related to the morphology of the tumor. And we can observe here a cartoon picture of how a tumor can look like. We can see that we have a central hypoxic area uh, that leads to a series of uh, cascade effects around the tumor. Uh, as different extents of immune infiltration, dysregulation of the extracellular matrix, recruitment of um, cancer-associated fibroblasts, uh, but we can also see how it increases the phenomenon of neoangiogenesis, which means that uh, more nutrients will be uh, delivered um, to the tumor, but in a very disordered fashion. So all of these different characteristics really make uh, the tumor more invasive and dangerous. We can also look at intratumor heterogeneity by focusing on the cellular level. And we can observe from this picture that we not only have cancer cells, but we have a plethora of different phenotypes populating the cancer. And uh, in particular, we can see that we have two main categories of cells that are associated with um, cancer, uh, immune cells and stromal cells. The presence of stromal cells is generally associated with um, uh, cancer growth actions, uh, while immune cells can have a double action. In fact, some immune cells can be recruited by the cancer cells um, to help uh, the cancer grow, and this is particularly true in cells that have immune suppressive actions like T-Rex cells or M2 macrophages. However, immune cells can also infiltrate the tumor in order to fight against it, and this is particularly true in the case of CD8 positive T cells and N1 macrophages. Let's now focus on the heterogeneity of cancer cells. This heterogeneity happens at the cellular and at the molecular level. We can observe here how due to the um, genomic instability of cancer cells, they can have genetic differences, but they can also be in very different epigenetic states. Uh, they can uh, show uh, different functional states, 
And some cancer cells can also act like stem cells, meaning that they can be responsible for the clonal evolution of the cancer and they are also responsible for the relapses after treatment. Here we can also observe how the different populations of cancer cells can interact with all of the different healthy phenotypes that populate the cancer. And these interactions happen through the morphology of the tumor microenvironment. So these three different factors really play together in order to modify the properties of this disease. And it makes cancer very um, adaptable to different conditions, including clonal pressure itself. It comes without saying that uh, the tumor microenvironment plays a very important role in prognosis and treatment. Uh, here, for example, we can see how uh, abnormal tumor microenvironment and vasculature is more associated with uh, invasiveness of the tumor, while a normalized structure is more benign. We can also do um, prognosis uh, on the basis of the different phenotypes that populate the tumor microenvironment. For example, the presence of CD8 positive T cells is generally associated with uh, good prognosis, while the presence of microphages like N2 microphages is generally associated with negative prognosis. So we can also look at the clinical implications and summarize it as it follows. Uh, the different drug diffusion and immune infiltration in different areas of the cancer can lead to heterogeneous therapeutic response. In addition, the spatial variability can create biases when we perform biomarker-based trials and also when we study biopsies. Finally, the genetic variability of the cancer can lead to different responses to clonal pressures going to uh, enhance the population that is actually not affected by the treatment. Here we have a cartoon picture that exemplifies these kind of issues. Uh, for example, if we do a biopsy on a primary tumor, we might not be able to observe the old tumor microenvironment, and so our treatment can lead to a residual disease. And once again, this disease can lead to relapses, which need a new biopsy in order to be uh, you know, well identified as a new uh, metastatic disease. If we always use the first diagnosis, we might not be able to provide the right treatment to the new cancer that we have. So really, the tumor microenvironment needs to be monitored over time. And this leads me to the next part of our presentation. Here we can observe the different ways that we have to analyze the tumor microenvironment. The most widely uh, accepted and reliable method is to perform 1D single cell analysis. And this can be transcriptomics, can be genomics, and it can be proteomics as well. And it can be obviously all of the three combined together. Uh, the very first challenge in this case is to be able to extract the tumor from uh, the patient or the uh, preclinical model, to store it and be able to also dissociate it without disturbing the cells too much. And this is a big challenge and we will see how the gentle max technology will allow us to get reliable data in single cells. We will then review the 2D methods or spatial analysis for the tumor microenvironment. And in particular, we will see how the maxima can allow us to perform high multiplexing in the two dimensions, which really tackles the morphology of the tumor microenvironment and opens the field of spatial biology for us. Finally, we also have 3D methods for doing spatial analysis based on light sheet microscopy as the blaze microscope. Uh, in this case, we can detect and quantify the tumor metastasis and also the vasculature system. Um, but finally, it's very, very important that we also monitor all these changes over time using longitudinal studies. So in this webinar, we will review only 1D and 2D analysis. Let's get started with single cell data. Having a single cell resolution from a tumor tissue really unlocks the cellular heterogeneity present in the tumor. It allows to detect subpopulations that cannot appear in bulk study but can be responsible for drug response. The limitations and challenges uh, are related to the difficulty in assigning different cell functions and also uh, to the fact that we don't have any special information. So these kind of studies will eventually need to be integrated uh, with spatial analysis, for example, by the Maxima, to uh, get uh, genetic and phenotypic aberrations in space. 
but there is also a more intrinsic challenge which is related to the quality of sample preparation. Uh, in fact, if we don't have the proper sample preparation, uh, the dissociation step will induce stress on our cells and we will not preserve the epitopes that we need. We also need to have a good viability and yield of the different populations. So it's very important that we perform the dissociation in the right way. And here you can see the research workflow for single cell analysis. First of all, we will need to store our tumor after dissection, and then we need to dissociate it. Um, the sample usually needs several cleanup steps afterwards, and then in most cases, will we need to enrich the cell type that we are interested in studying. Uh, finally, there's going to be a QC step, usually by flow cytometry, and then there's going to be single cell analysis, which will be either proteomics, or genomics, or transcription transcriptomics data. But in all of the cases, what you need is a very good sample quality, so a debris-free sample uh, with many viable cells. And if we are only studying nuclei, we will need intact nuclei, and also we need to obtain single cells and not clumps. So we need a preparation method that can be gentle and fast at the same time. So in order to achieve this goal, first of all, we can use the max tissue storage solution, which can allow to preserve our tissues, either human or mouse, for up to 48 hours. And here we can see some flow cytometry data that show how the viability is not impacted uh, and also how the solution allows to preserve the immune population originally present in the tumor. Finally, we can observe how the stress-related uh, genes are not upregulated after 48 hours from dissection. The next step is to perform the tissue dissociation. This is done through the use of the gentle max octo dissociator with eaters, which can perform a gentle dissociation because it combines the mechanical disruption provided by the gentle max CT resection with the enzymatic uh, digestion of our tumor dissociation kit. So this procedure is both fast and gentle, and it's also highly reproducible and intrude. It provides viable single cell suspension uh, where the epitopes are preserved for downstream assay. A similar procedure is also offered for the extraction of intact nuclei. Uh, in this case, we will use our nuclei extraction buffer, which will allow us for a fast extraction done very gently in a cold temperature. Um, this procedure is highly reproducible and also high throughput. It provides intact nuclei which are compatible with single cell nuclei gene expression analysis. At this point, we need to purify our sample with uh, several steps. The first one is to filter our cell suspension with the max mars strainers. Uh, the second step is to remove dead cells with our max technology. Uh, and finally, we can lyse red blood cells and also remove the debris from our solutions. These steps are very important as they impact the quality of our genomic data. And here we have a study on several tumor samples where we perform three different steps of purification, going from the filtration to two rounds of dead cell removal. And we can see here that the cell recovery increases with each cleanup steps. And it's really, really important to perform all of these steps in order to obtain enough cells for our study. We can also observe how these different purification steps allow for a high degree of reproducibility across different samples of the same breast cancer tumor. In addition, uh, we can observe that the tumor heterogeneity is fully preserved as we can see both uh, different kinds of immune cells and mammary cells. Uh, here we are talking about the cell enrichment process, which is very important for many downstream assays. This is done through the MAX technology, so magnetic activated cell separation. I won't go into details for this, but I will let you know that this uh, cell enrichment process does not induce stress on our cells and it also it does not impact our viability. Here we can see an application for single cell immune profiling of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We can observe here that we took an ovarian carcinoma sample and we performed our a standard research workflow uh, and we completed it with T and B cell isolation. Obviously, the dead cell removal will increase the viability on our cell but we can also observe how many more T cells we can obtain if we perform the isolation step. 
Finally, I would like to show you how single cell data can also be obtained from FFPE tissue samples, which are the main source of archives for retrospective studies in cancer research. So here we can observe that our FFPE kit allows for performing a similar research workflow, uh, where we can also perform cell enrichment by uh, targeting cytokeratin positive cells, which are usually the carcinoma cells. Uh, we can then perform DNA extractions, but this, um, this uh, workflow uh, can also be compatible with single cell RNA sequencing. So here we can see results from a recent studies that show how um, the frequency in somatic mutation increases if we can study the separated tumor fractions only with respect to the unseparated sample reported in black. And this result is also quantified by this Venn diagram, where we can see that the tumor fraction has 25 mutations only found in this kind of sample. So again, this is also compatible with single cell RNA sequencing, which is very, very popular nowadays. So in conclusion, this research workflow for single cell analysis um, is straightforward, but it's also very critical for obtaining good quality data. In fact, it can minimize transcriptional changes, it can increase the number of cells that we can recover, and it can also allow us to target uh, particular cell populations, increasing the resolution of our data. We can also perform a flow cytometry QC at the end, which will tell us if the quality of our sample is high enough in order to do single cell um, analysis. So it's really important to follow these steps in order to obtain reliable and high quality data. And with this, um, I will pass the mic to our uh, new speaker, Dr. Jabloski, who will talk to us about 2D spatial analysis using the Maxima platform. Thanks, Maria. And so as we kind of start transitioning now from the single cell aspect into, you know, being able to give this spatial context to the tissue heterogeneity that uh, Maria was talking in her previous slides, I like to always just show this simplified view of that. So in this example, we have something like a smoothie that kind of represents our bulk sequencing, right? We'll be able to maybe get a, a really broad view of, of the things in here, maybe discern a, a little bit about it in terms of, well, maybe this is based up of mostly strawberries, but again, there's no individuality that we understand from this. And that's where, when we started moving into the single cell analysis, you know, thinking also single cell sequencing, the really great thing about this technique was that it gave um, the ability to really appreciate the heterogeneity in there is that we were able to break it down and see these individual components start seeing rare populations you know being able to see those different fruits or even the different uh, phenotypes that would be in that tumor microenvironment so kind of the last portion of that is then is that you know these may have already originated from some kind of spatial context or spatial location which is what we're thinking about when we get into spatial biology Right, that it may be that the you know kiwis and the strawberries and and you know other fruit that's in that salad actually originated from a specific location that their closeness or you know the way that it was arranged actually influenced maybe these phenotypes or you know overall how this tumor microenvironment comes together, and so that's really what spatial biology is doing. Um, and trying to investigate for these tissue microenvironments. And so while we start thinking about this and how spatial biology and, and the tumor microenvironment come together, I think the really nice thing is that it's opening a new avenue um, to studying the complexity of these different various you know, cancer biology aspects. You know, now we can start asking a lot more questions about the interaction between certain cells. So, you know, do certain phenotypes interact with each other? And what does that mean for the tumor microenvironment? We can also think about it in terms of, you know, the growth um, of that over time, or actually also at a molecular level, all these different avenues that the spatial context of these cells now becomes important. And so there's been a lot of different techniques that have arisen to be able to probe the spatial biology aspect. 
For this particular talk, I'm going to be focusing on those that are emerging in the imaging methods, specifically not only the specific techniques, but also different workflows that have looked at the tissue level and being able to understand at a tissue level of the tumor microenvironment how these different things come together uh, with that spatial context. So the really nice thing about the imaging methods is that it allows us to retain the spatial information of the markers or the different cells within the tumor microenvironment. However, some of these traditional methods, uh, while they do maintain the tissue organization, are traditionally limited by the number of channels and thus the number of markers that you can get on a single piece of tissue. So on the left, we show, have things like H&E and chromogenic IHC stains, which are really gold standards for marker observation. But as you can see here, we've only got one or two. This is where also then immunofluorescence methods have kind of grown and expands that number, you know, maybe to four to six. But then it's the light spectrum and the nature of the fluorochromes that limits the clean detection of the you know, additional channels and markers. And so that's why there's kind of been this push to move past this barrier to really get down to the different phenotypes of all the different cells that could be present in the tumor microenvironment. So there are a lot of different methods out there that you can use to overcome these limitations that we talked on on the previous slide. We base our method on immunofluorescent cyclic staining. We call this Maxima Image Cyclic Staining, or MIX for short. In this approach, what we're doing is we're taking prepared tissue. This could be FFPE tissue sections on slides or frozen sections. And we basically, within the instrument, uh, apply three basic steps. The first of these steps is to stain with up to three primary conjugated fluorescent uh, antibodies on that tissue. In the picture here, I'm just showing an example of I could combine something like CD326, CD3, and CD31 uh, within that cycle. And then the next step is to image those sequentially along with the DAPI stain for the nuclei. So here we would then take those images, store them, and then the last step or the third step is to erase that signal to kind of get a blank slate all over again. So these steps and the image that you're seeing looks very similar to the image that we saw previously. The new aspect of this is that now that we have removed that signal, we're able to do another cycle of this. So now we have the tissue again in which we apply the same three steps of a fluorescent uh, stain with up to three antibodies, image those sequentially along with the DAPI, and then do an erase step. And I think what you can see here is that we, con we continuously do this until we build up the number of antibodies that we would need for a particular project. So this could be as simple as maybe eight or 10 antibodies, or we could even go up to hundreds of antibodies for a particular project. We've done up to 400 on a single piece of tissue. Again, this is not something that we do every day, but you can kind of see that, again, this has the flexibility to be able to look at as many that you would need to really characterize that tissue microenvironment. And so what's really nice about this is that we're able to capture more of these different markers and more spatial information from a single piece of tissue. So for the example I'm just showing here, I have a traditional four channel aminofluorescent image of colon carcinoma. And in here we are visualizing tumor cells in green, leukocytes in red, blood vessels in blue, and then some fibroblasts in this grayish color. But now that we're able to expand out the number of markers that we can see on that single piece of tissue, now I can actually start looking at a whole host of other populations. So not just leukocytes, but I can start breaking that down into say CD8 positive T cells, you know, T reg cells. I can also then see maybe the natural killer cells, the myeloid cells, the dendritic cells. And I can even ask questions like which of those cells are proliferating. Again, this is just all of these different markers are still on that single piece of tissue but now I'm able to actually take certain cell populations and see more of those and have that spatial context of where they are within the tumor microenvironment.
And so I'd like to just kind of briefly introduce the Maxima Imaging Solution and how we kind of bring different aspects together to be able to get these results that I showed you in the previous slide. And this breaks down into what I like to call, say, four different aspects of the whole end-to-end so -end solution. It comes together with the fully automated instrument, so being able to not have to constantly manually stain with all these different cycles that is all done within the instrument itself. Uh, the different sample carriers that can come together, so whether or not you're doing, say, a TMA or individual biopsies, we have the support mechanism for that. And then also having validated or pretested antibodies that really can accelerate your research and having the flexibility of this being either a you know design panel by yourself and having these off-the-shelf antibodies or even having a more standardized mechanism with the RIA screen plates to really accelerate and get through your sample. The last aspect of this is, is how do we bring all these things together, right? So in the previous slides, we were seeing all these different, um, different cell populations within the image. And what really kind of brings this to fruition and, and, and allows us to start interpreting and taking these images and putting them into interpretable data is the last portion of the image analysis software. So what do I mean by being able to extract interpretable and meaningful data from these images? So if we think back, right, when we were at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we were talking about all those different, you know, phenotypes and subtypes of cells that could be in the tumor microenvironment and how these can come together and have different, uh, you know, um, influences on prognosis or, you know, also treatments as well. And one aspect of this we might want to understand from the tumor microenvironment would be something like deep phenotyping those cells. So being able to profile all the immune cells, the tumor cells, maybe even understand certain checkpoint markers in there. And that is certainly something that is obtainable uh, with a technique like this. So for this example, I'm just showing kind of this immune profiling of different T cell subsets in tonsil. And so on the left hand side, I've just kind of listed out how we define those different phenotype uh, or those different populations in terms of the uh, presence or absence of certain markers. And on the right hand side, I'm just showing how we kind of can break that down within our software to be able to use scatter plots that you may even be familiar with in flow cytometry to be able to get to these populations. So for example, I can take a scatter plot of CD3 expression and CD45 expression, and then be able to gate and look at those that are double positive in both CD3 and CD45. And again, the nice aspect of this is it's not just I have that population, but I can also see that on the image, which is the image in the bottom left-hand corner. We can then even drag this out and look at of that T cell, you know, CD3 positive population, we can look at different classes of that. We could look at those that are CD4 positive or CD8 positive and look at how the breakdown of the T cells can then be in these two different populations like you see on the right hand um, corner. And the last aspect of this is that we certainly can also take this even further to see even maybe those rarer populations uh, within that and then see that on the image. Additionally, once we have this all mapped out, uh, very similar to flow cytometry, we could also get the quantification or the enumeration of these cells and also look at the different percentage of the populations within all of our cells. Now, another aspect of this, and again, really the nice, the nice thing about having, you know, these images in that spatial context is we can now start localizing these cells within the tumor microenvironment. So I'm going to just show you an example in which we're going to be looking at tumor infiltrating leukocytes. So let's go back to that example of the colon carcinoma that I showed you a few slides back. Here now on the left hand side, I've got my tumor cells again, they're now in red, and then the leukocyte population, which is now in cyan. Now, if we were doing, say, single cell analysis of this and we're able to, you know, uh, 
get the dissociate the tumor um, uh, population and be able to isolate those specific leukocytes, I could be able to get the actual information from the infiltrating leukocytes. Well, I can similarly do that here in which based on the closeness of the leukocyte population to the tumor cells, I can then identify these actually in the same image and have infiltrating leukocytes, which I have highlighted here in green and also in that uh, zoomed in portion on the right hand side. I think the really nice aspect of this now is, is that I can also start understanding my non-infiltrating leukocytes. So within this whole population, there was obviously going to be some leukocytes that were not associated with the tumor, may would not have been you know, collected and be able to isolate out. And now these non-infiltrating leukocytes, which I'm highlighting in magenta, I can also be able to start understanding maybe what's going on with that portion of the population. And so now I can start actually asking more questions about what's different in these two infiltrating leukocytes and non-infiltrating leukocytes. So the example I'm showing here is that for each of the populations that I've um, identified, did a k-means clustering, and then looking here is that each uh, row is the different clusters for those two populations. And then across the bottom is the expression for each of the markers that were in the panel. And so the nice thing now is, is that I can make comparisons and look at those different expression signatures um, for each of the markers for those two different populations. And the interesting thing for this particular ongoing research project is that there were seven markers that were identified uh, to have different expression profiles between these two populations. And so now we can start making conclusions of why, why is it like that? Is this possibly a good avenue for maybe uh, specific treatments and things like that? Lastly, right now that we are able to phenotype and also localize those cells, the really nice aspect and the power of spatial biology is being able to spatially map different cells to each other or to different locations within the tissue microenvironment. Example, I'm showing here some uh, breast cancer tissue uh, in which I have the tumor region, which is just defined with some cytokeratin markers that you see here, cytokeratin 7 and cytokeratin 5. And we can see this uh, on the image along with the DAPI for the nuclei of those. And then I also can identify uh, the T cell population within this environment as well, using the techniques that we talked about earlier as well. And now I can start asking questions like, is there potentially a difference between those T cells that are close and maybe interacting with the tumor versus those further away? And I can set this up in terms of understanding the spatial distance um, of the T cells from that tumor environment. And so I can kind of set up, say, zones, or the example I'm showing here is different zones in which, in a rainbow effect, I'm saying red are those T cells that are closer to the tumor environment uh, versus, you know, going towards blue, those that are further away. And I can see this also on the image itself, where white now is identifying that tumor uh, cytokeratin positive region. And then we've got, again, the red T cells being closer all the way up to the blue being further away. And now that I was able to spatially map these different populations, I can go back in and look at things like the expression profile of those um, T cells that are closest and then moving further away and start maybe making some um, observations from that. I know it may be hard to see on the screen, but for these different populations that we mapped out, we were able to see those that were closer to the tumor-defined region were actually uh, CD8 positive, indicating they may be uh, more likely to be cytotoxic T cells. And on the flip side of this is that the increase of expression in CD45RA and the decreased expression of CD45RO and HLA-DR you know, likely also it has the meaning that these cells are likely naive T cells and not activated. So this is just an example of kind of the, uh, you know, things that we can draw out once we've mapped uh, the individual cell populations.
And to wrap up, I'd like to just give an example in which we can use these techniques in specific immuno-oncology applications. I'm going to be focusing on a particular area of interest uh, here at Milton Biotech of looking at um, the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma microenvironment and then certain therapies to be able to treat this. So for those that are unaware, PDAC is currently the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths and it attributes to around 90% of all pancreatic cancer cases. It's a really devastating disease with overall poor survival rates and there's little effective treatment routes um, for patients that have this. And so there's really this need to find new therapeutic options for them. Uh, a new and promising therapeutic approach is actually adoptive cell transfer, you know, specifically uh, talking about CAR T cells, which I just kind of got there down in the right hand corner of the, the diagram that I have um, there. So there have been some current clinical trials uh, with specific targets. However, they have a lot of varied efficacy and outcomes. And additionally, we want to be able to find those specific targets that are tumor specific, but then have limited off tumor expression. And so to investigate this, uh, we were able to combine it with other techniques, some of that you've already seen uh, previously in this talk as well, to be able to first identify those very specific uh, target candidates, um, you know, and then also making sure that they were safe and had limited off-target effects as well. We can then take this and once we've generated the CAR T cells, be able to use the mix technology to also then validate maybe the mechanism of action that is going on in this treatment. So the first aspect of this was being able to find targets that were on the tumors specifically and not express say on immune cells or anything else. So to do this, we were able to identify each of the individual cells and then create a heat map that you see here on the screen. And just for reference, each row represents one marker that was inside the panel. And then each column is actually an individual cell. So these may be very, uh, heat maps be, may be very familiar to some of those in the audience. Uh, what I'm pointing out in the boxes is just for those cells that were high in the tumor expression, these were also the areas that we were looking for other markers that also expressed high or had high expression as well um, to be able to look at as potential targets uh, for CAR T uh, uh, development. And while this could certainly be done, you know, say with looking at different flow cytometry, the nice aspect of being able to do this with the mixed technology was that we also had the images associated with each one of those individual cells that we saw in the previous heat map. So now we can not only go back and look at and confirm our findings of you know, ones that are not tumor specific, like say the CD59 on the left hand side, but then we can also confirm say things like CD38, which would have shown high expression within the tumor region as well. Um, and also maybe make some decisions about ones that were kind of borderline, say, CLA, which is, you know, maybe excreted by the tumor and decide whether or not we want to include this as our potential targets as well. On top of that, we can also have these images to look at the different morphology and also have that as part of our decision making process as well. So in combining the mix information along with other flow cytometry data, there were four particular targets that showed high expression levels on the specific uh, tumor uh, location. So the next aspect of this is, is while we have high specificity for the tumor, we want to be able to limit those off target effects or, you know, that we don't want to see that this target is or specific targets that we're looking at are also going to be expressed in other areas of healthy tissue. So what I'm showing here is just an example of the four, or sorry, three of the four targets, CD66C, T-SPAN8, and CD318, that again showed high specificity to the tumor. And now we're looking at different uh, healthy tissues and making sure to look for those uh, you know, off-target effects. 
So it's looking pretty promising that for CD66C and CD318, as that we see high expression in the PDAC model, but not anywhere else in, the, uh, in all of the other tissue sections. So after the selection of the targets of interest, you know, several CAR T uh, cells were generated and administered, and then you know, looking at the tumor reduction in these different mice. And so you can see that on the left-hand side, looking at the bioluminescence, and then also the tumor size uh, for both or for all of CD66C, T-spin eight, and different linker linker lengths, and then also CD318 as the target. And as we graph this on the right-hand side. I think the important thing I just want to point out is that as we're looking at this, we can see that there is a no reduction, right, for CD66C, but that we do see this very, you know, marked reduction in the CD318. So the interesting aspect of this is, is despite all of the previous work that we were looking at that indicated both of these would be valid targets, there obviously is a difference between these two, and that's where we can actually go back to the mixed technology and start asking questions to why. And so we can look at things, you know, looking at the difference of the CD66C, which is going to be the top row, and then the CD318 uh, on the bottom, as we can start looking at things like whether or not there was actual CAR T cell infiltration, which would be the first two panels indicated in the LNGFR um, blue for, you know, the actual CAR T in there. But then also looking at things like is there tumor remaining? How much macrophage infiltration? And then also, is there a possibility that there was down regulation with the CAR-T administration um, in the last panel, which we don't see? So this is an interesting aspect of why we're seeing these different results, despite the initial indication that these should have the same efficacy. And so that's just one example of how you can use this to start asking kind of questions and doing immuno-oncology applications. But I've also have a couple here up on the on the screen if you would like to investigate some of these more, looking at things like um, macrophage niches, uh, also looking at uh, sm the non -sm uh, small cell lung cancer, and then even glioblastoma. So in summary, I hope that you can see how spatial biology has really been bringing a new light to understand the tumor microenvironment complexity. You know, once we started adding on this multiplexing to the current imaging possibilities that are out there, you know, we're able to really do a lot more and get a lot more information out of these tissue, single um, tissue sections to be able to do things like deep phenotype and also then localize where those are within the environment, but then also importantly, spatially map, say, you know, the possibility of cell to cell interactions within this environment that can lead to different prognosis and progression of certain cancers. Additionally, I hope that I showed you at the end there, that there are also, you know, that this really does complement immunotherapy, um, certain discoveries and other immuno oncology applications. And that really, again, this all boils down to bringing spatial context to the tumor microenvironment. In conclusion, in today's webinar, we explored the heterogeneity of the tumor microenvironment. Additionally, we've looked at how different inter and intra tumoral heterogeneity, like morphologic and phenotypic aspects, can influence the projection of cell populations to either promote or suppress cancer. This can also play a role in the progression, prognosis, and different treatment avenues. To understand and profile this, one can use our gentle, fast, and reproducible sample preparation to have high quality 1D single cell analysis or expand that to 2D spatial analysis to include the context of these cells. If you'd like to learn more about all our workflow solutions for investigating the tumor microenvironment, please use the QR code on your screen. Thank you for your time and attention today. 